And finally, the third video in the 19th century political development series, this is all about imperialism, which is an enormous topic, and we will be covering in very brief, but we'll be seeing it a lot later too. So here's the big picture, part one, because, because part one. Industrial nations in Europe needed natural resources and markets to expand their economies because they had that crazy industrial revolution thing happening, which we've talked about. Uh, these nations competed to control Asia and Africa in order to secure their own economic and political success, as in natural resources and places to sell their stuff. So that's big picture part one. Let's see part two. Part two is that imperialism, this taking control of other nations for your own gain, spread the economic, political, and social philosophies of Europe throughout the world, because when you take control of places, your culture is put on top of stuff. Um, and then resistance to imperialism took many forms, including armed conflict and intellectual movements. And sometimes one caused the other, and sometimes the other caused the one. So let's talk about the causes of imperialism. The Industrial Revolution, which you talked about in our previous unit, caused this demand for raw materials as they needed more cotton and more coal and more iron and more um, food, actually, um, and lots of other things. But that demand for raw materials led them to seek, uh, led European nations to seek those raw materials elsewhere. And the competition for markets was when those European nations now had stuff to sell, needed to make money selling those things, and so found places to sell that stuff. And basically it was like, extracting raw materials just like we learned with colonies and colonization earlier and then selling back the things you make is the core function of how an industrial economy relates to a pre-industrial economy but there were other causes of imperialism too because imperialism wasn't just colonialism it was an expanded thing that these nations were doing now with its own sense of purpose and its own philosophy and basically imperialism also included motivations from militarism uh that's the idea. Basically, you know the expression, um, if all you have is a hammer, everything starts to look like nails? Well, they had a hammer, and it was called guns, and also uh, cannons. And basically every problem that they saw in the world, uh, as they were trying to impose their imperial control on places, could really be solved with a lot of military force. Um, and political stuff, but a lot of military force. Because the places that they were conquering did not have access to the industrial technology that they had, which is why they wanted to go out and conquer stuff in the first place. So there was just a, just a pleasant marriage of the ability to conquer stuff and the sudden desire to conquer things. Um, nationalism, which was helping create nation states in Europe, then also led to competition between those nations as they sort of solidified and were able to expand their control beyond just the little tiny place on the European continent that they were living. And then finally, and it's, there were racism and religious views that led Westerners to believe that bringing European ways and religions would improve the lives of people in these countries that they were, you know, conquering and stuff. Um, and that comes in part from previous beliefs before the Industrial Revolution and imperialism, but also once you're in control or you, you go out to seek control of other countries, you start to need to justify it to yourself. So racism and these religious views in some ways caused imperialism and were then deepened by imperialism as well. So here's the immediate results of imperialism, uh, as in like what happened when these Europeans went out and did stuff. The European economic, military, and political power forced colonized countries to trade on European terms because they couldn't compete and make goods that Europeans were making. They definitely could not compete and have the guns uh, and then later like railroads and not tanks yet, but um, military force that those countries had. And the nations of Europe were very unified and had a tendency to colonize first in places that were not very unified. So they had the political power to force these colonized countries to trade on European terms. Um, the industrial produced goods from Europe then busted into these colonial markets and resulted in all the traditional industries of those places being displaced, pushed out of the way. So if they used to make tools using their local iron or local bronze, now all of a sudden they're using steel tools from Europe, which they have to buy. They're better, but they're not locally made, and that results in an imbalance of trade with those countries um, and also a dependence on these European goods, which then results in those countries being sort of politically dependent as well, and it's, it's a whole cycle. But here are these different kinds of control that Europe would have over these places. 
as a controlled place, you might be a colony, which is a settlement directly ruled by another country. And a good example of that is British India in the late 1800s, where the government of Britain had taken total control over the majority of India. And that meant political control, economic control, military control. A protectorate was a little bit different. That's a country whose affairs are partially controlled by a stronger power. And a lot of times there'd be a local ruler uh, who would sort of be ruling in place of that larger country. And a good example of that would be French Indochina, which is that area that the peninsula is in regions south of China. Spheres of influence were pretty different because they're a foreign region in which a nation has control over trade and other economic activities, like in, in China when the European countries set up these small areas where they could trade and no other European country could, but also China didn't have control over its own trade on its own territory in those areas because they didn't belong to exactly, but were controlled legally and also economically by these British, uh, by, the, by the European countries. The British had a very large area. Here's the impact. And this is a short, short, short list of impacts uh, on Africa and Asia, but it's the ones that are perhaps uh, most important for our unit. So Europeans dominate, dominate huge chunks of the world. Um, and they're doing this all, again, pursuing markets and materials. Europeans then carried their own conflicts into the colonies and would fight both over colonies and then also just fight in colonies over stuff that's happening in Europe. Uh, Christian missionaries are able to gain converts, and so um, the Christian religion spreads around the world. China is divided into spheres of influence, like I mentioned earlier, and loses a lot of its own power and control over its destiny. Uh, the Suez Canal, which links the Mediterranean and Red Seas, uh, was a major point of contention between European countries because it's the short route from Europe to India, and Britain in particular eventually gets control of the Suez Canal. Uh, the East India Company dominates Indian states. That's before, we talked about, I talked about earlier where the British government takes total control of India. That's the late 1800s. Before that, the East uh, India Company, which is a private company, uh, dominates these Indian states sort of in the place of the British government. But actually, it's just a private company that's kind of ruling a state. It's a very unusual circumstance. And then America, one of our first acts as part of this imperialism thing, we open trade with Japan and actually force Japan open to trade with everyone. But it wasn't just Europeans acting. That it, Whenever you talk about imperialism, there's a tendency to just talk about what the Europeans and the Americans did. But in reality, the people who lived in those places made choices for themselves. They had agency, and so they responded in various ways. There were armed conflicts, like the Boxer Rebellion in China. You can see here uh, an actual photograph taken of a person who was participating in that rebellion, a boxer. And they say boxer, which is funny, boxer as in like boxing, as in like punching, because there were there were martial arts that were associated with these people and in Europe and the United States. We only had the context for boxing. We didn't really talk much before about martial arts. So it's kind of funny they ended up being called the boxers, not like boxes, but like boxers. And then also the colonized respond with a rise of local nationalism. So Europe carries these ideas of nationalism into those places and then takes control and says, well, we have nationalism in Europe, but you don't hear. Instead, all of the people who live there, like in India, built up nationalist parties and in fact built political movements based on nationalism, to respond to these imperialist designs of European countries. And that's all for this PowerPoint.